welcome to Kuzidi Sabbath School. We are in the lesson number four of this quarter when we are studying the present truth in the book of Deuteronomy. This is going to be a thrilling lesson. We are looking at the theme of to love the Lord our God. I'm Barack William, going to be your host. I'm together with. And I'm your favorite co host, Al Fajiri Mwanawa Asubui. Thank you very much, James. It's a blessing to study the Word of God with you. Today, it's a duet a tune that is going to be sung and recited by two gentlemen. And before we begin, I would want to invite you, James, to pray with us before we study the word of God. Shall we pray? King of heaven and earth, we adore and bless your name. We come before you this time. We pray that you guide us in our study as we are going to delve deep into the word of God. We pray that you give us an understanding. May you quicken our hearts that everything that we are going to learn today might be for the benefit and for the edifying of the church, all for the glory and for the honor of your name. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, James. As I said before, we are studying the theme of to love the Lord our God. Now, the word love is uh, one of the most prominent words in the Bible. And you see the Bible is comprising 66 books. The two books in which the word love appears the most is the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon. In the Song of Solomon, love is being used in, uh, in a matrimonial context, probably the love between a man and a woman, which in a greater way is depicting the love between Christ and the church. But in the book of Deuteronomy, the love is used in a covenantal relationship, basically between God and his people, how we are relating with God. So when the word love is being used, the word love is, you see, a word cannot be used on its own in a sentence. So the word love is appearing uh, related to some three important words. Uh, we have God, we have fear, and then we have the law. We are going to see in this week's study how these three aspects of love are very important for our spiritual growth as Christians in such a time as this because we are also looking at it in the context of the present truth. And so we are going to look at uh, the love for God what does it mean to love God? How are we going to love him? We are going to look at uh, love and fear. You see, love and fear are some certain things which are not supposed to, ex to coexist. You love and then you fear at the same time. But we are going to see what does it mean also to fear God as we love him. We are also being told in the Bible that uh, where there is love, there is no fear. But then we are going to see it's almost a paradox. We're going to see what the word of God tells us. And then finally, we are looking at the love and the law. As we know, when we hear the word law, we think about uh, legalism or some force to do a certain thing. But in most cases, love is spontaneous. And love is like water from a spring that flows on its own volition. We are looking at it in the context of Jewish economy. And among the Jews, the most important prayer is lifted from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. I don't want to read it in the Hebrew because I am not a speaker of Hebrew and I don't want to make mistake and say my own things. But in English, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. It was so important. It is being said that while the Jews are reciting that in their prayers, they are closing their eyes. They don't want any other thing to interfere with them. And so as we get into this study, trying to look at how we are going to love the Lord who is also our God. We want to understand this deeply because if we understand or if we know God as it is our privilege to know him, it will be easier to relate with him. How do you love somebody whom you don't know? So maybe James, what does it mean to love God? The book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 beginning to read from verse 1 mm -hmm. begins like this. Now this is the commandment and these are the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, and you, your son, your grandson, and all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. We, want, we have the burden of uh, trying to explain what does it mean to love God. Now the children of Israel are at the border of the promised land and it was the work of Moses to encourage them 
actually one theologian says that it is it was the work of Moses to tell them or to give them instructions on what they are going to do and how they are going to uh, how they are going to to, to act in in in, the, in that promised land but but above that now this 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 uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 1 to 2 now focuses on uh, loving the Lord your God now let's read for us Deuteronomy chapter 6 now verses 4 and now verses 5 as we try to uh, delve deep into what it means to love your God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, chapter verses, six verses 1 and 5. Verses five. five. This is what the Bible says, and I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mm -hmm. with all your soul, and with all your strength. Yeah. What does this mean? It means that love to God has taken the supreme priority over love to other things. In fact, if I, have, I am to read a quote from Ellen White, the book is Lift Him Up, page two, page 142. Mm -hmm. she, say, she, start, she starts by quoting uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 30, that says that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. Now listen to what Ellen White says in the book, Lift Him Up, page 142, that I saw that whatever divides the affections or takes away the heart, supreme love for God, or prevents unlimited confidence and the entire trust in Him, assumes the character and takes the form of an idol. She continues to say that I was pointed to the first and the greatest commandment, the one that we have read in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, loving the Lord your God with all thy soul and with thy mind and with thy strength. He says that there is allowed no separation from the affections of God. Just expounding, it means love to God has to be supreme above every other thing. And lastly, about loving to God, it means that uh, in our toils, in our work, in our conversation, and in everything that we do, we must show love to God. So loving, loving God supremely and loving God uh, with all our hearts means that God is given the first priority. When you wake up in the morning, what is the first thing, do you, what, what is the first thing that you do? Do you just run to your phone or do anything? That is, anything that takes the first place in your life means that that is your God. That, that is your God or that is your, your, the, the person that you have given your supreme love. Therefore, the love to your God means that you give God the supreme love that he needs. And therefore, I'd like to ask my brother Kowili, you will notice that in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5, mm -hmm. there is something that is called love your God with all your heart, with all your might. So, uh, in my study, I, I noticed that this you are is a singular. What does this teach us about loving God? Do we love God as a group or do we love God individually? What does this teach us about loving That's God? wonderful. Well, in the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer that Christ gave, we are calling God our Father. But in relating to God, God is calling us individually. It's like, love you, God. God, the Bible, that Bible, if it was applied to an individual, it's like James, love the Lord with all your strength, with all your soul, and with all your heart. So it is, the relationship is an individual, even though God created all of us, but we are responding individually. We are liable individually to love him. Yeah, that is so profound that even though God loves us as a whole, but we have an obligation for us that we should uh, love God individually. It should be your own personal uh objective to love your God. So that is what it means to love your God. Probably you want to tell us about what does it mean to fear God? Oh, thank you very much. In most cases, we don't want to see the word fear and love in the same sentence. We expect if you love somebody, there is no fear. But then fear can be, uh, can have a lot of meaning. In normal circumstances, we fear trouble. We fear problems. And we won't run away from problems. But then if we love God, then to fear God should not be able to mean that when we see God, we're running away. But then the concept of God's uh, respect or who he is, which you can first of all read the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10, verses 12. I don't know if you can get there and read for us from the New Living Translation of the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 10, 
we look at verse number 12 and the bible says mm -hmm. and now oh and now israel mm -hmm. what does the lord your god require of you mm -hmm. he requires only that you fear the lord your god and live in a way that pleases him and love him and serve him with all your heart and soul thank you very much so we love and fear god in most cases how we behave before god is very important how we how we understand him because one thing we need to realize who we are god created us in his own image god gave us dominion over everything on the face of the earth but through disobedience we have become the children of wrath away from god through christ we are getting another chance to get to uh, to god now if the angels who have never fallen in the presence of god they bow with a lot of reverence and they sing holy 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 it means that also us the fear of god in this context is the reverence is the humility is the obedience with which we handle uh, the things of god and with which we walk with god sometimes when you read the bible that now come boldly through to the throne of mercy that one does not mean that we come with pride and confidence in our own selves and so that we can be able to talk to god the way we want sometimes i see there is sometimes we conduct ourselves in the way we do uh, maybe our music or a lot of things we do. Sometimes we do it with uh, unconsciousness of God's uh, presence in our lives. So the fear in this context is the reverence, is the understanding that the God we are serving is a holy God and is telling us that he shall be holy for him who has called you is holy. If God indeed is holy, then we need to be very careful the way we come to his presence. But did you know that the entire world is the presence of God. The way you conduct yourself probably in a restaurant, you are in the presence of God. The way you sometimes conduct yourself in a public service vehicle, you are in the presence of God. So it is calling us to be able to be, um, to be aware of God's presence in our lives and so we be able to serve him as a holy God who deserves respect and obedience, perfect and perpetual in the way we relate with him. And so, in most cases, we tend to love people as we respond to whatever they have done good to us. Your parents have been so nice to you, then you say, oh, I love my family because they have been kind to you. Your girlfriend has been so nice to you, you say, oh, I love my girlfriend because she respects you and she's treating you very well. But then, God loves us. And then you're being told that he first loves us. What does it mean that God first loves us? What motivated God to love us first before there was a response from our side? Because always our life is based on a response to what somebody has done to us. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the greatest argument, uh, uh, one of the greatest argument for the perpetuity of God's law, mm -hmm. is that God was not God was not willing to break His law. Mm -hmm. And as you read in John chapter three verse sixteen. Probably you can recite for us John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that he gave his only begotten son mm -hmm. that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And, and someone will ask, was this love an afterthought that God started loving us after we fell or did God had a plan? Mm -hmm. So we will, we, will, we will try to delve deep into looking at God himself did not wait for man to sin so that he can first love him and now find a way of redeeming man. The Bible reveals to us that God had loved us even before the foundations of the world were set. I'd like us to read from the book of Romans chapter 5. I think it's verse 8. Romans chapter 5 from verse 8. This text will help us to understand that even before God predated our existence in the plan of salvation, God had loved us. God had loved us even before he predated our existence. Romans chapter 5. Verse but God eight. demonstrated his own love toward us. Mm -hmm. In that while we were still sinners, mm -hmm. Christ died for us. Christ died for us. And therefore, we want to learn that, you know, for us human beings, we, we always love because. Someone has done for you good, you love because. But for God, God does not have a because. In fact, the beginning of this lesson was telling us that God is love. God is not a manifestation of love or God reveals love or God is lovely or God is love sometimes. But God himself is God is love. And now he first loved us. Do you know 
that in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 37, I'd like you just to read for us now Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 7 and 8. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 37, in Deuteronomy chapter 10 verses 15, in Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 5, in Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 3, all these texts reveal that God had loved them. These people were, this, the Israelites were, every time they were forgetting about the statutes and the judgments and the commandments that were given by God. But we see God manifesting grace because he loved them. Just read for us Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 7 and 8. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 7 and 8, the Bible has this to say. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you are more in number than any other people, for you are the least of all peoples. Mm -hmm. But because the Lord loves you, mm -hmm. and because he, he will keep the earth which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And now you will notice from those many verses that we have stated, including Deuteronomy chapter 7 that we have read, you will notice that God loved them. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 8, God did not choose you because you are many, but because you are few. And then verse 8 now gives us an exposition that because God loved them, he did what? He redeemed them. In fact, you remember the story of Balaam. He was going to curse the children of Israel. But God turned his cursings into blessings. The reason is why. You will read in Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 5, the Bible says that God loved them. So God first loved us. Now the question is, how does this text help us to understand who God is? How does this text help us to understand who God is? Probably you want to answer that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. See, so God loved us before, uh, he loved us before we loved him. Basically, we are seeing that God himself is love. And it's like God is thinking about us before we thought about him. He's having us in mind. The reason or the basis of us loving God is basically because God has loved us. As we read in the book of 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, that we love him because he first loved us. And as you saw in the book of um, the Desire of Ages, page 22, that the plan of redemption was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of man. It was a revelation of the mystery which had been kept in silence through time's eternal. It was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. And that is the principle of love. That is very, that is very deep and profound about telling us the character of God. And now one, one man once quoted and he said that it is a mystery to, to know the, the depth, the breadth and the, and the height of God's love. Imagine, ask, ask yourself how would God deeply love sinners but hate sin. That is a mystery. So this tells us that God first loved us. You want to tell us about love. When you love God, you have to express it. Do you? Oh, yes. Tell us about it. In the human context, people have what we call languages of love. Mm -hmm. So if you love somebody, mm -hmm. you hold their fingers you love somebody, you buy for them gifts, you love somebody, you do acts of service. Because when somebody said, oh, when you said, oh, those people love each other, it's not because of what they are saying, but whatever they do, whatever we can be able to see. So if in human context we express it that way, then sometimes we should change God by saying that, oh, I love the Lord. I love Jesus. I love the Holy Spirit. But then God is telling us that uh, it's like God is interested to be shown something. You love me, show me. God is saying, you love me, then do that which pleases me. So if there is something which pleases God, which is the foundation of his throne, is his will expressed to humanity through his commandments. It is the very essence of what God is all about. If God says do not kill, then it means that God is not a murderer. God would want us to enjoy our lives without the fear of potential death coming our own way. And so if you look at several books in the book of Deuteronomy, as God is expressing his love, the word commandment looks redundant. In the book of Deuteronomy 5.10, Deuteronomy 7 verse 9, Deuteronomy 10 verse 12, 13. But I want you to read for us Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9. In all those books, it's like God is talking about his love. And then the word commandment or elements of obedience is finding the way into it. From the New Living Translation, the Bible mm -hmm. says, Understand, therefore, mm -hmm. that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is faithful. He is the faithful God 
who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commandments. Oh, thank you very much. So, those who love him and obey. It's like love and obedience is going hand in hand. But then the basis of this obedience is not, you see God is not coming. Look at this situation. Imagine God came out of nowhere and then caught up with you somewhere and said, my friend, obey me. See, it looks, uh, it looks funny. You don't understand why. But then God is telling the Israelites, God is not calling them to obey before the Exodus experience. After getting them out of Egypt and preserving them through the Red Sea and doing for them all these things, God is telling them that it will be easier for you to relate with me if you obey me. And to obey God simply is to accept God's direction. If the Israelites accepted to travel from where they were to the land of Canaan, that was obedience. If God said that, let us go to Canaan, and then they started traveling to Ethiopia, and then getting to Kenya, that could have been something else. They could only get to Canaan by obeying God. It means that God is calling us to obedience after we have been saved. I want to say that if somebody is not converted, they need to leave God's commandment alone. God is not calling the unconverted to keep his commandment, because why do they need to keep it? The commandments of God basically is leading us or telling us how to relate with God. And so we only relate with God when we have said no to our inherited and cultivated tendencies towards error. And then we have decided that, no, we want to go on God's side. So God is telling us that, oh, you have come on, our, on my side. Thank you very much for coming. This is how we do things this way. We don't do that here. This is what we do this side. So basically, God is telling us that if we love him indeed, then we are going to show, him, to show him something. We are going to be willing and be comfortable with doing things this way. But then he has given us all the evidences, the reasons why we are supposed to do things this way. And that kind of obedience cannot be brought by just trying to be right. Like sometimes we keep the laws of the land without loving the governments that are serving us. It is because of love in seeing exactly what God has been able to do unto us. But then, in the Jewish economy, somebody wants to ask Christ, what is the first commandment? So you want to see, then what is this the first commandment? You have been it's in fear, fear God, love God. Then now, what is this first commandment that uh, Christ is calling us upon to look at? Uh before we tackle the first commandment, mm -hmm. I, I thought it was I, th I thought it that uh, probably we need to look at our motives. What is your motive in obeying God's commandment? Mm -hmm. In fact, the lesson writer is ask, asking, "What is your motive in seeking to obey God?" Mm -hmm. But Jesus made it easier for us. He says that love is a response. It is not. Mm -hmm. It cannot be commanded. Mm -hmm. God cannot just come out of nowhere, as Kawili said, and that's and commands you, "Love me or keep my commandments." Mm -hmm. So love is a response. After knowing who God is and what he has done, then we, we respond by loving him. But now the big question remains, if, if that is so, then Jesus gave us a very easy, easier one. He says in Jeremiah that I'm going to write my laws and my statutes where? In your heart. So that you love from, from the heart. And that is very important for us if we are to keep his commandments and if we are to express that love. Now, do you know that the Jewish... The Jewish people, they had 613 laws. And therefore, it, it looked like a stupid question to uh, a teacher of the law, like, this, la, like the one who asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment, to ask Jesus, which is the greatest commandment. Yes, they, they had 613 laws. But, but, but one historian says uh, that some religious leaders, they tried to distinguish between the major and the minor laws. And this was a subject of great controversy. So this person came and asked Jesus a question in Matthew, Mark, Mark chapter 12, verse 28. Which question was that? The book of Mark uh, chapter, chapter 12, 12, verse 28. He asked a question. Uh, 12, 28. Mm -hmm. This is what the Bible says. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, mm -hmm. perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Mm -hmm. Then Jesus answered him, the first of all, the commandment is, Hear, O Israel, mm -hmm. the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And ye shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. 
as I had said, this had been a t uh, this had been a topic of great controversy. But Jesus made it so easy for them. First of all, Jesus did not start quoting Deuteronomy chapter six verse five. He started by quoting Deuteronomy chapter six verse verse four that says, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one." Now Jesus here points to them to the key affirmation of the Lord as their God, and only as they understand that the Lord their God is one, then they can really uh, base the, this great truth that they are called to love Him. And Jesus summarized all those 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 two deep, those 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 uh, commandments, in fact, into one, into love. And they are further summarized into two: love to God and love to man. In the first four commandments, are love to God. If you love God, number one, you will not uh, you, you will not uh, you will not go and uh, and and try to worship other gods. Number two, if you love God, you will not try to misrepresent him with uh, mere objects. Now God asks, uh, what is it that you will compare it with me? In fact, some, also in the Bible, God had warned the Israelites from looking at the sun and the moon and worshipping them. And then in, if number three, if you love God, you will do, you'll not do what? You will not... Uh, you will you will, you will not misuse his name if you love god you will obey his day that is the the lord's day and then for the others love, love the others to loving our neighbors as we, as we love ourselves is borrowed from the book of leviticus chapter 19 verse 28 so jesus knew that their understanding of the first commandments he summarized the commandments into two love to god and love to man but now we are focusing on the first commandment jesus knew that their understanding of the of god will help them do what to love him well and that is why you ask yourself why is it that in many churches today probably in the seventh day adventist churches we have a problem with how people dress we have a problem with how people wear we have a we have a problem with how people play their music you will go somewhere else and people will say we are dancing to the Lord. But someone once said that if you see people dancing and, uh, and uh, in fact, Habakkuk says, Habakkuk 2.20, that the, the Lord, Lord is in his holy temple. Uh -huh. Let all the world the, keep silent so before we need, him. So we need to give God an awe, a reverence that he deserves. So these people, by, by them doing what they are doing in, in, <laughs> in their understanding that they are praising God, it means that they... It it shows that the, it shows that the understanding of God does not really uh, does not really show who really God is, and that is why they are dancing. If they would have known that God is to be awed, if you go before God, you have to go, uh, you have to be reverence, you have to be reverenced in His holy name, you have to be reverenced before His presence. Then it means you have to do what you have to obey God. So that tells us that gives us the foundation of the first commandment: love to God. As I have given the expository in the four commandments. Now, someone, you asked this question in the, at the beginning, and I'd like you to answer it again. Mm. <laughs> if someone were to ask you, now, how do people come to love a God that they have never seen personally? What will you say? And I think it's the challenge of the Christian world that mm -hmm. we... It was the challenge of the Israelites because they wanted to see him. And I heard while you were saying that God even warned them. In the book of, uh, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, you say chapter 4, but then, yeah, chapter 4, verse 18, mm -hmm. 15, uh, God is saying, that take careful heed to yourself, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb, or at the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly and make for yourself a carved image in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female. God is warning against things seen so that we can be able to have an experience with him. But God has revealed himself to us not in things that we sometimes, in a way that we can be able to see him, but God has revealed himself to us through his acts. He first loves us. God has revealed himself through his goodness. We look at natural world and we see goodness of God. We see his super abundant mercy. You know, when God was supposed to be, when God was supposed to deal with us in terms of justice, then some of us may not even experience the showers of blessing in form of rain in our fields. Because God is responding to us, but God is so merciful in that God has revealed himself in whatever he has made. And God has sent Christ to us. I read somewhere in the book of uh, Desire of Ages, uh, page 19, that by coming to dwell with us, Christ was to reveal God both to man and to the angels. 
He was the word of God. God's thought made audible. God has revealed himself to us through his acts. And because God first loves us, that is the reason that we are going to love God, that we have never seen face to face, but we have seen what God is doing in our lives. We have seen what God is doing in the world in which we live in. And the greatest testimony that we'll have is a testimony of personal experience with God in my own life as an individual. That is why I love God that I have never seen. The Ten Commandments are going to help us to draw a line of demarcation at the close of the ages of, of this world. We are going to choose between those people who mm -hmm. obey God, all the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. and those people who obey probably eight or nine commandments. Therefore, the commandments of God are going to help us to draw a line of demarcation. And, and for us to really keep these commandments, as I had already said, it is important for us to do what? To know who this God is. And as we know who God is, then we can appreciate that God is merciful. And then we will respond by loving him. Amen. Thank you very much. And so we are coming to the end of this uh, study to love God. We call to love him. But then I found a profound uh, quotation from the book Great Controversy 61 that in Christ, the cross of Christ will be the science and the song of the redeemed through all eternity. In Christ glorified, we will behold Christ crucified. That is what God has done to us in the action of going, coming to redeem us and get us back. So basically, our only reason to love God is because God has first loved us. As fallen human beings, our love is always in response to what you said, because. But it's like God's love to us is, I love you despite. I don't love you because. Because if God was to have a because, then God has a thousand reasons not to love us. But then God loves us despite. If we have such a God who loves us despite what we, we have done, then in your life today, as we are looking at this context, in the world in which you are living today, you may be struggling with something. You may not be the best Christian, but God loved you before you first loved him. God still loves you despite. And so we have all the reasons to come back in obedience, in fear, and in trembling that we may still walk with him. Christ glorified is our brother. And so with him, we are the sons and the daughters of the kingdom. Maybe you're parting short or you're carrying home before we finish this great study. What I've carried home today mm -hmm. is about the fear of God. And it's, mm -hmm. it spoke so much to me that to fear God, is, as, as you had said, is not to tremble before his presence, mm -hmm. but it is to realize who God is and what he wants us uh, and what his claims are on us. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if we can fear God the way he, deserve, he wants us to fear him, then it means we can do what? We can also love him. And uh, my, if you will ask me to summarize the whole of this uh, week's lesson mm -hmm. in one sentence, oh, yeah. I would say, if you will really understand who God is, then you will love God. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Let's pray. You can continue studying your Bible, the book of Deuteronomy, so that you can be able to enjoy this lesson as we're studying together. Let's pray as we come to the end. Eternal Father, King of glory, we thank you that we had the privilege of studying your word. But the study alone is not enough. Knowledge alone is not enough. But the knowledge that has been put in practice will transform us, will subdue all unchristlike uh, tendencies and attributes that do not glorify your name. Lead us, keep us safe until next week as we continue studying your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. amen. Thank you.